Uh, good evening, folks. Um, well, for some of us, I suppose it's morning. With, with Scott is in, is in Australia, he's in morning time. But I want to acknowledge that tonight uh, we're speaking to you from the uh, ancestral Mi'kma'ki country, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kma'ki people. Uh, and we acknowledge them as past, present, and future careholders of the land. We are all treaty people. And for me, and I know for the Center for Local Prosperity, uh, these are not just words. A lot of the work that the center has done has been about that territorial rights of Mi'kma'ki. So tonight, uh, I just want to set the stage just a, a little uh, about the Center for Local Prosperity and a little about these dialogues. And then I would like to introduce our uh, three speakers. Uh, the Center for Local Prosperity uh, really began in 2014. And uh, as a local prosperity, local economic driven organization, nonprofit, really active, uh, activist grassroots organization to put on uh, conferences, to write papers, do research, on uh, local economics. We branched out in about 2016 into the topic of climate change with uh, the Thinkers Lodge uh, group. And the Thinkers Lodge uh, in, up in Pugwash was the center, 1957, for the first conference on nuclear war. And uh, the, the people who, uh, did that, the organization, uh, uh, the Eaton family, uh, came to the Center for Local Prosperity 2016 to see if we would want to delve into the topic of climate change. And, and we did. And uh, this, uh, we've had five different conferences, retreats on, on climate change. And this is our, our, our first series of dialogues on climate related uh, topics. Um, the general theme of these four dialogues uh, are climate-induced societal and ecological breakthrough in Atlantic Canada. And I, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but the way we got to dealing with this topic is uh, Bob Cervelli, the executive director of the Center for Local Prosperity, who, by the way, is, is celebrating his 43rd wedding anniversary tonight, as we speak. So Bob and Susan, happy anniversary. Um, and Bob and I uh, kept having discussions about the severity of the climate crisis and uh, what that means to Atlantic Canada. Uh, and what I did is I took a, a period of, I call it withdrawing, withdrawing from the fray, and just kind of closed down for a period, turned out to be a period of about seven months and tried to read and study everything I could on the climate crisis. And it became deeper and more horrible as I went. But on the other hand, I became hopeful because I, I, I connected with pieces of work and individuals that were making a real difference. And that gave me great hope. There were two individual pieces of work that really made a difference to me. One was written by Bob Corton, who started the Great Turning Project. And he said something I haven't been able to shake. He said, when we get our story wrong, we get our future wrong. And that really hit me heavy with the idea that the story that at least I was living in, and the story often I was telling, was the wrong story. And then I came across Thomas Homer, Homer Dixon's work on the Faculty of the Environment at the University of Waterloo. And he reminded me that as the systems break down, as the climate systems break down, as the economic systems break down, as the political systems break down, there will emerge breakthroughs that begin to surface. And so Bob and I talked about the theme that we're talking about 
climate-induced societal breakdown, breakthrough, is really about seeing what we can do in four dialogues to begin to identify some breakthroughs globally, nationally, locally, that could apply uh, to, a broad, uh, to a broader new story for Atlantic Canada. Uh, We're gonna hold four of these dialogues, one every two weeks between now and the end of July. There's the second one, and, uh, which is July 30th, is really on a steady state economy. We're gonna talk about what is there an alternative to the forever growth model that we're under now, using GDP as the, as the great measure. Is there another economic system that may be applicable to Atlantic Canada? Uh, on July 14th, we're going to have a dialogue on litigation, the, the special role of litigation, uh, and uh, uh, legal rights of nature. The last one we're going to have on July 28th is really a more holistic, looking for a more holistic architecture for all of Atlantic Canada, uh, really around the idea of building inclusive communities. And all of those dialogues for me kind of add up to the possibility of crafting a new story about a new economy, a new political system, a new sense of governance, a new, a new system of jurisprudence, uh, uh, and a new architecture for Atlantic Canada. So that's, that's kind of where we're headed with this. Um, this dialogue tonight is on governance. Uh, and the challenge, I think, is that I think in some of my work that there is currently no system of governance that's set up to deal with the climate crisis. So that's what I think we're going to explore a bit tonight. Before we get into it, before I introduce the speakers, a couple of housekeeping details. Um, we're going to, this is an hour and a half long. We'll stop it at uh, uh, 830. And during any time during here, if you have a question that you'd like to ask us, if you would just go into the question and answer box, type in your question, we'll get to, we'll get to as many of those as we can in the last 30 minutes of this dialogue. Um, this webinar is going to be recorded. If you, if, if you can't make it or you know someone that would like it, if you come go to the Center for Local Prosperity website, you can sign up one for the newsletter and you can request one of these recordings. I think that covers those housekeeping items. So tonight we've got three speakers. And one thing I, I, I kind of did the math, I don't want to be embarrassing to anyone, but I did the math on the speakers tonight, myself and the speakers. And I added up that we've been at this collectively for a little over 200 years. And I kept thinking, my gosh, you think in those 200 years, we would have had it solved. We haven't, but what I do believe is after tonight, we'll be just a little bit closer than we were an hour and a half before this. Um, so tonight we have David Orr. I've known David for, for, for a while. Uh, and he has this unique ability to take these big ideas and localize them. Uh, he's, he's written uh, extensively on ecological uh, literacy about really changing the, the language, the political language, the, uh, the, the social language, uh, more in line with uh, ecological thinking, ecological reasoning. He's probably done more of that than anyone I know. Uh, and uh, he's written on ecological literacy, climate change, and the democratic system. And his latest book, series of, of, uh, of edited work, is called Democracy Unchained, How to Rebuild Government for the People. Uh, he organized a series of studies on water, energy, and material use in colleges, which became part of the Oberlin Project, which is certainly one of the greenest buildings in North America. Uh, and he served on uh, at least 10 foundations currently, and uh, uh, including the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and he's currently a trustee of the World, World, Wildlife, or the World Watch Institute. 
He's been awarded eight honorary degrees and a dozen other awards, including the Lyndhurst Prize, the National Achievement Award, and the National Wildlife Federation Award. For David, I think the thing I keep going back to is for David, all education is environmental education. And that sort of education is how we live or need to learn to live on the world today. Rankin McSween uh, uh, is uh, joined the nonprofit community group New Dawn Enterprises in Cape Breton about 40 years ago and served as an executive director of that institute for, I believe, 41 years. New Dawn has provided at home care senior services, meals for seniors, cooperative housing for seniors, and supporting housing for people with mental illnesses. He's involved in career training and has raised and invested capital in local businesses. New Dawn has gone on to launch businesses and social enterprises in the areas of immigration, food security, and the arts. Rankin announced his retirement, I believe in January of this year after 41 years. I talked to Rankin one time to explain to me what New Dawn is as a program. And he enlightened me by saying, it's probably not best to think of it as a program, but think of it as an idea. An idea around which a community can become passionate uh, around finding local solutions. Rankin served on the board of directors for the Center for Local Prosperity for three years. Um, and in, uh, Rankin set in on our, and participated in our first climate change retreat at the Thinker's Lodge. And he said something that I've never been able to shake as well. He said, what we are confronting with the crisis of climate change, it's impossible. It is beyond us. But on the other hand, throughout history. The most interesting things have been those moments in history when a people decided to do the impossible. And that is what we need to do now. It is in that spirit of optimism that I think we can begin to write a new story. Scott Leckie uh, lives and works in a little south of Melbourne, Australia, where tonight it's some of the coolest weather he's ever experienced in, in Melbourne. Uh, he's the founder and director of D uh, Displacement Solutions. He's an international human rights lawyer, an academic, an author, a social entrepreneur, an environmentalist. He's recognized as one of the world's leading global housing, land, and property rights experts. For over 30 years in his human rights career, he has carried out human rights work in more than 80 countries throughout the world, everywhere except uh, Antarctica. His interventions have helped to protect hundreds of thousands of people against planned forced evacuation in communities in the Dominican Republic, Panama, Philippines, South Africa, <laughs> Thailand, Zambia. And he's also dealt with property rights to help tens of thousands of refugees and displaced persons in Kosovo, Georgia, and Timor. In 2016, he advised the UK government and the Norwegian a refugee Council on Programming on Land and Peace in Myanmar, and also designed plans to develop a climate bank there. In the same year, he established the One House, One Family at a Time project in Bangladesh that's actually building houses for climate displaced people. In 2015, Scott was, and his Displacement Solutions was awarded one of the most pre prestigious UN uh, Saskakawa awards in recognition of the work and support of climate displaced people. And Scott currently is in discussions with the Center for Local Prosperity in the looking at outlining a project proposal to evaluate the social and political and financial readiness of Atlantic Canada to accept climate refugees. So those are our speakers tonight. We're going to conduct, I suppose, a, a very heartfelt personal story related dialogue on these issues. And I'd like to turn it over just briefly to, um, uh, to David Orr, who said something to me that I found very interesting. He said that, uh, that, that the, uh, the democracy will probably not survive the climate crisis. And the climate 
crisis will not be solvable unless we can preserve democracy. So it's that issue that perhaps we can open with. David, if you could address that, that would be helpful. Gregory, thank you very much. And uh, to both Scott and Rankin, it's a, a real honor and privilege to uh, be with you in this uh, setting for a few minutes. And I think it, in the previous conversation we had on Monday, uh, we identified a good bit of overlap between your work and, and uh, uh, the work that uh, Gregory's doing. And so we're gonna build on that, but let me start with a story. I was on a foundation uh, uh, years back and we had a proposal from a uh, uh, kids at a local school they asked for funding to tear out a parking lot and put in a school garden. And so we did it and uh, they set about to tear out the, the asphalt in the, the parking lot and they got a jackhammer from the local city government and they tore out the concrete uh, bib around the parking lot and they began to uh, plant a garden. And in the process, uh, they learned a lot about how things happen in the world, and they learned a lot about gardening. Uh, they learned a good bit about uh, nutrition because they the, the food from the garden went into the school kitchen. Uh, the surplus that they grew went to a, a local restaurant. So they learned, learned a bit about making money. So we called, as uh, dutiful foundation officers, we called uh, the, the principal kid who was then in eighth grade, roughly, uh, 13 or 14 years old by then, to come in and give us a report on what they did. And I'll never forget his remarks. Uh, one of us turned to him and said, well, what did you learn in this project of tearing out a parking lot and put it in a garden and so forth? And we expected kind of a routine answer. And what he said, and the way he said it was very striking. He looked at us like that was the dumbest question in the world. And his answer was simply to say, we discovered that asphalt isn't forever. I thought that was great. They saw not this uh, paving over of the world. They saw opportunity, opportunity to make money, learn, do something different, uh, and have fun in the process. And so I think that uh, if I switch gears and go up to governance, Democracy rests on that kind of initiative. People like all of you on this uh, <clears throat> program and uh, sort of the panelists that see problems as opportunities to do something better. It isn't that it all comes down from the top, it starts at the bottom. And so the spirit of democracy grows in those little settings, small organizations doing, uh, as Rankin put it, the impossible things that just can't be done, but they did it. That's where we are tonight. And that's the, the spirit in which uh, uh, th this work proceeds. And I've mentioned only one other thing. Uh, the work of Greta Thunberg, uh, since when did Western civilization depend on a 13, I guess she's now 16 year old, reminding us of our moral duties to the future generations. That is genuinely heroic. And what are the odds of that? She had no PhD and no expertise and not much money. But here we are that the most prominent prophetic voice is that of a teenager. It reminds us of what we have to do. Again, what appears to be impossible, but we're gonna do it. Let me stop there. R Rankin, a uh, new dawn. How did, uh, what's the story there in, in terms of not only working with the community, but, but um, the governance piece of that? Sure, great. Yeah, I'll be glad to give that a go. Uh, but let me uh, begin, I, I wanna tell you, I, I mean, I do, I do feel a bit self-conscious here. I mean, I, I mean, I'm uh, your other two guests. I mean, Scott uh, has this grand international footprint. And David um, has this extensive experience that is at least in the United States, and it seems to leak beyond that. And I've spent my life uh, on this small island in the middle of the North Atlantic. 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite self-conscious about uh, the size of their footprint and uh, mine. Although I have a big foot, my footprint is pretty tiny, relatively speaking. Look, let me, let me, let me try and get at the new dawn thing um, like this. And, and, and I need to tell you something of my own story um, in the process. So uh, look, I, I was brought up here in Cape Breton. I was brought up on this farm, this small farm. And I, as a very young boy, I spent most of my time with my grandmother. My grandmother had worked the farm her whole life. Um, and, you know, her legs were gone, terrible arthritis and rheumatism. So as she used to say, I can now only do sit down jobs. And her main sit down job was looking after me. So it was a wonderful uh, three and four years. Uh, my first three and four years were with her. Um, so, um, it was interesting. My, 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 my grandmother, I didn't know my grandfather, he had died, but she'd speak of him uh, very, um, in, very affectionately. He had, he had, he had no education at all, but she was proud of him. And she'd say, because he knew his place. Mm. Uh, he didn't get involved in uh, the question of the larger questions of the community. He, he minded his own business and looked after his family and, um, and his church. Um, and that was it. And she really encouraged me to emulate that. Um, the, so I think, I think there was this, she had had a, um, a brother-in-law who had gotten involved in the union, big coal mining country here back then. And he got involved in the union and uh, think that had gone badly and he was banished. So we ended up having to leave Cape Breton and leave his family here. And he found work in Winnipeg, which is a long way away from Cape Breton. And in many ways it really, that really um, scarred and marked the family and pointed to the cost of stepping up. So um, the other thing that was interesting about my, my early years, it was interesting in Cape Breton, um, when I was growing up and largely still the same, the understanding was you just left. Uh, there, was no, there was no work, there was no opportunity. Uh, we were poor, so you left. So, in my little community, occasionally there would be parties, community gatherings for some young person who was leaving and people, families would give them $5 to help with the cost of transitioning. Where we went to would change. I mean, before my time, it was Boston and Detroit. Probably in my younger years, it was the city of Toronto. In the 1970s and 1980s, it was Alberta. And more recently, it's been Halifax, which is the capital of the province we're part of here in Nova Scotia. Um, so I, I just, and, and it was what's fascinating to me, I never questioned that. I mean, I just planned I was going to go because everybody went. Um, so I'm, I think I was in my second or third year university and um, myself and a friend decided uh, we, we were going to make big money uh, this upcoming summer. So we decided to go to Vancouver. Now Vancouver, as you would know, the other side of the country entirely. Why we were possessed to go to Vancouver, I have no idea. I mean, I'd never even been to Halifax. And, uh, so we're going to Vancouver. Uh, I remember the train, we bought it. We bought a train ticket and the train was 60 bucks to, to get all the way to Vancouver. That's what it cost. Anyway, when I'm in Vancouver, I go to visit. My father's had an uncle who was living in Vancouver, in North Vancouver, and he was living with his son and his daughter-in-law. So my father had insisted when I'm there to call them up, I do that, they invited us over for dinner on a Sunday afternoon. And uh, so they put on this, uh, this special occasion for me in that uh, the chill, the, the, my, this, this gentleman, my father's uncle, his son and wife, had grown children and they were all invited to be part of the dinner. And so they come and I meet them all 
And over the course of the meal, it becomes clear that they're all living in Vancouver. They didn't move which is a bit shocking. I mean, I, there was no family in Cape Breton that I knew of where people didn't move. And here they were, they were living together as a family. And that shocked me. And I think I felt quite jealous of that. Anyway, uh, but you know, you get on with your life. I finished school, uh, ended up the local university in, in um, which is about, at that time was about two hours from here in a place called Antigonish, then went to the University of Ottawa. Then I finished and came to Halifax. And uh, I was working for the government, decided to leave that. I was going to go back to Ottawa. And I get this call, this job offer, and I end up, I agree to come back to Cape Breton for a year, and I was really shocked. <clears throat> So this is, I, I won't kind of drag you through the knot hole of all the details of this, but that question, look, we were living in this story, talk about story, we were living in a story here in Cape Breton that we were poor and that we were powerless and that this is the way it was going to be forever. Um, so I ended up getting involved. The guy who started New Dawn, he was a Catholic priest. He was teaching uh, at the university, at the junior college here at the time, it's now a university. Um, and Greg started to call these meetings, which is really an important moment in terms of the importance of the host. Who hosts the meeting? Gregory, this is really important. This is a, uh, this is a critical thing. So he calls this meeting and Greg, Greg, now, now Greg, at that time being a priest that had a bit of um, cachet, he was an academic, more cachet, and he was pretty unconventional and um, pretty charming fellow. So he could hold the group together. And so Greg, Greg would just uh, wonder out loud, well, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? Uh, we should put a committee on this. We should put a committee on that. So, um, and I got pulled into that um, and um, it was like getting caught in a vortex. And um, I think what that vortex for the most part was when I, as I, as I reflect on it, is essentially we were, we were, Oh, and the, the, we, we didn't, didn't have this language at the time, but essentially what we were trying to do, we were trying to understand why the story that we were living, like what was the basis of that story? And at the same time, I think we were trying to change this to another story. Um, you know, a story, a story that um, had to do with possibility. Uh, and hope and prosperity. Um, and, and it was, and it's also been interesting that uh, there, there, there has been this clash. New Dawn continued to clash with, with both levels of senior government. That, and and Adon was not inclined. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the number of conflicts we've had over that time, you'd think we had a character disorder or something, you know, there just seems to be one fight after another fight. But I think it, it's, that, it's that these are two very different stories. I think for the senior levels of government, Cape Breton is this problem, has always been a problem. And the question has been, what do we do with these people? And I think um, if, you're, if you're sitting in Cape Breton, I mean, you're beginning and you start to do things what you're uncovering is that people are the asset and that uh, the possibilities are unlimited. There's no reason for us to be poor. There's no reason uh, that our young people have to leave because there is opportunity here. There is possibility here. 
but we're caught, we've, we've been caught for so long in this other, in this old story. And, and, and the business of New Dawn has been trying to help shape another story, um, a story, a story of faith and hope, um, and a story about a grand future. So I, I think it's taken me a, life, a lifetime uh, of work to understand how restrictive the wrong story can be and how powerful the right story can be in terms of transformation. Um, so, and you all know, I, my, I haven't spent a lot of my life on the issue of climate change until now, but it seems to me that what really excites me about about this issue, and, and I know there's a lot, to, there's a lot of darkness here, but at the same time, it seems to me there is a possibility here in terms of using this as an instrument to change the story locally uh, and nationally and ultimately internationally. And I'll stop there, Greg. Sorry that took so long. No, great story. Scott, you talk one time about all your international work, and at the end of the day, you find out, I think, that local stories are perhaps the most progressive. Could you reflect on that a bit? Sure. I'll, I'll start with a, a brief introduction, and if I don't go back to that, just remind me. Um, so I am speaking from the territory of the Boonarung people um, who first settled this land 15 to 20,000 years ago, um, recalling that Australia, as it is now called, uh, was settled by its First Nations people 65,000 years ago. Right. White people came here slightly over 200 years ago. So do the math and uh, co just contemplate that for a moment and imagine the position that the original inhabitants uh, have today uh, compared to what they have had for 64,800 uh, years. Uh, they have never ceded their land rights. And as many of us always say, always has been, always will be in reference to their land. But as life is full of paradoxes, the older you get, the more paradoxes you realize are there. Um, I'm also speaking to you from the modern political jurisdiction of the state of Victoria, which is the number one worst CO2 emitter per capita of any political jurisdiction in the world. So put those two things against each other and think about that for a moment. Um, Australia's climate change policy is well known to be easily the worst of any in the Western world. And uh, we don't need to dwell on that too long, just to, just to point it out that there's a long way to go uh, so the lucky country, as, as Australia is often called, is not so lucky when it comes to um, climate change matters. Now, I, I, back to the first point you made, Gregory, about the, um, the question of locality, that's yet another paradox. So everything really at its core happens locally, and yet all of us live on the same planet. So we must simultaneously be planetary in perspective as well as local in perspective. And one thing I've indeed noticed all around the world, of course, is that the more local you go, the more people are concerned about what affects them most immediately, which is the things that they see every day and the things that they smell every day. Very few people will want a, a, a coal-fired power plant to be placed within the view of their back garden. Very few people want to breathe in toxic smoke. Very few people want to have a toxic waste dump put right next to them. Um, the list goes on. 
Um, and very often people fight against these things, which are ultimately climate destroying things. Um, they tend to fight less hard when the matter is outside of their immediate vicinity. And that's another point we just need to all ruminate on. Um, and why is that? And what, what can we do to facilitate greater engagement by all localities everywhere to support localities everywhere? So our locality should support your locality and vice versa. And particularly when it comes to the question of climate change and the issue that I work on every day, which is climate displacement, um, just a few quick factoids to show you what we're talking about here. The first of which is, it's very important to remember that we're all of the world's ice to melt. That's the Arctic, which as you all know, living in a country that contains much of the Arctic is melting at a rate much faster than it initially projected. And if you include Greenland, all the glaciers of the world and Antarctica together, global sea levels will rise up to 68 meters above their current level. That will literally change the shape of world maps as we are used to them today. It is that severe of a change that we can anticipate if things don't stabilize and reverse. The coastlines of the world will look fundamentally different in a few short years than they look today if things continue at the current um, trajectory. For many, many years, the, the figure that was bandied about in international circles about climate displacement was 250 million people maximum will ever be displaced because of climate change. No one uses that figure anymore. Uh, the figure now, it's, it's varied, but it's double, triple, quadruple that sometimes even more than quadruple that. So we're talking potentially 500 million, 750 million, maybe a billion people um, that may need to find somewhere else to go. Now, if we recall that um, less than 5% of the world's population today lives outside their country of birth. And the vast majority of those do it out of necessity, not out of choice you see the type of disruption which we are likely to encounter in the future. So we can throw up our arms and say, this is horrible, this is terrible. Um, or we can try as both uh, Rankin and David were mentioning to turn this human uh, challenge and tragedy into an opportunity that can be beneficial to everyone involved. Now, just another example before I go into a couple of the opportunities that might, you know, uh, be possible. Climate change is already so bad, and it's not the only factor, but it's a, ma it's a major one. In, in the country closest to us here, well, second closest, um, Indonesia, um, they have made a formal political decision to relocate the largest city of Jakarta. Imagine that. Imagine the government of Canada saying, we're moving Toronto, and we're starting next year, <laughs> and we're going to start moving it all the way up to the Arctic or somewhere else in another province, because it's simply untenable to continue to have the 10 million people that live here today uh, continue to live here into the future. That's already been decided. That's already underway. Um, how it's going to be carried out is a whole nother story. And obviously, it won't be as fair and equitable as we would like it to be, etc. And there's all sorts of problems associated with it, just to point out the scale of it. Bangladesh, a country where we're also very active, just so you know, again, it's anywhere between 20 and 40 million people. So potentially more than the entire population of Canada uh, who will be permanently displaced from where they're living uh, today. That's just one country. So we're, we're dealing, and I'm not even going to go into the small island nations um, of the Pacific and the Caribbean and elsewhere where uh, they actually face existential threats. Um, you know, in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, depending, uh, some of those countries may literally cease to exist, um, depending on the speed with which the sea level rises. I have been in Kiribati many times, and one time in particular that I recall, I, I ran into some Japanese guys at the president's office, and I said, what are you guys doing here? I've never seen you here before. And they said, we're, we're selling some things to the government. We're trying to. And I said, oh, what are you selling? That's interesting. And I was thinking like, 
you know, electrical gadgets or cars or something. And they pulled out a portfolio and they were actually selling artificial islands, huge, gigantic artificial islands that could be anchored to the bottom of the sea for a billion dollars each. Um, needless to say, that was outside the range of the government of Kiribati to purchase. But just to show you the scale of, of, of the absurdity that is associated with this whole question of, of climate change and climate displacement. So just to bring it back to um, Atlantic Canada, um, I've been a lot in Canada. I lived in Vancouver for a while and I've spent a lot of time in Toronto and Montreal and Quebec and Vancouver Island and all those kind of places, but I've never been to um, Atlantic Canada. I was meant to be there uh, last year, but uh, that dirty five letter word got in the way, um, COVID. And um, so I had to cancel the trip, but I um, hope, hope to make it there sooner than later. We are, by the way, the second most unfree country in the world to this day in terms of travel. Only North Korea is it harder to get out of than Australia right now. Uh, we literally can't travel, um, uh, which has its reasons, but um, it would be virtually impossible for me to fly to Canada right now if I wanted to, just to say. Um, so how can we make uh, climate change and climate displacement and climate related migration into something that could be beneficial to Atlantic Canada instead of it being a problem. So in the first instance, and I won't speak too long on this, I'll come back to it later with, during the questions and things, but just to say, you know, first and foremost, Atlantic Canada has to make sure that it's ready to deal with the climate consequences that it itself will face. And it needs to first diagnose the scale of the problem as it affects them as everywhere in the world does. So where are the places in Atlantic Canada that are most under threat? Where will people have to move from? How many are there and, and, and what time frame, and what, what costs are associated with this? And plans need to be put into place and institutions within government and, and civil society need to be put into place to make sure that people are looked after um, in that regard. You know, once that's taken care of, you need to start thinking of, you know, is there anything that we can do as Atlantic Canada to, you know, improve the situation with regard to the human effects of climate change ourselves. And you know, one thing that could be done, um, which would benefit people arriving, which would potentially benefit people living in Atlantic Canada and, and certainly the economy and also help the government and so on and so forth, would be to begin contemplating the idea of, of having a, a welcome sign um, on the borders of Atlantic Canada that says we welcome climate displaced people. We are one of the places in the world that feels that we would like to have you here in our area. We can benefit from you being here and you can benefit from being here. And we can go into a million and one ways by which you can have a mutually satisfactory relationship emerge in that regard. One concrete step that the federal government of Canada could do for instance, would be to include a new category into its immigration categories, which was specifically dedicated to the question of climate displacement. So they're not refugees per se, because they're not fleeing well-founded fear of persecution, as you have to prove if you're claiming asylum. Um, and they're not necessarily economic migrants or other forms of migrants. They're not going to necessarily study there or whatever other status they may have. But they would like to move somewhere because they can't live where they're living now. And, um, you know, you have to be flexible in terms of interpreting that and so on and so forth. But turning Atlantic Canada into a climate displacement haven effectively and establishing several of these around the world initially as models for what could be done in a positive manner to address this problem, in my view, would be a great thing to at least um, explore. You know, most people, most places who have to move will not be compensated for the loss of the properties that they have. For most people, most places, it's their land and their home in, in which most of their assets are, are vested. Uh, they'll lose everything and they'll end up moving to the slum. They'll end up moving to very poor conditions. And having climate displacement havens open globally um, is one way in an organized, you know, transparent manner. Um, 
by which you can at least slightly smooth uh, the rougher edges of this big and very rapidly growing uh, global problem. So I'll, I'll stop for there, there for now. Uh, th th thank you, Scott. One of the things, j just hearing, hearing the three of you that, that, that is always perplexing to me is Atlantic Canada, Nova Scotia, a very small place. I think collectively Atlantic Canada, we've got 2.5 million people. That relates to not much of a budget for local municipalities. Most of our money comes down in a sense, you know, funding from Ottawa passes through. In terms of the urgency of climate change, the, the, the time frame that we have and the scale of how we can work, I always worry about how much we can do. I mean, we, we certainly try and do things like um, become resilient in terms of uh, producing food locally, producing as much energy as, as we can locally, trying to, try to deal with the transportation systems locally. But that just never seems enough when the full impacts of climate change start to uh, materialize. I mean, we talk about growing good local food and I can see some of the large agribusiness saying, that's fine, let, let them think about their farmers markets and whatever, but we're gonna start buying as much land as we can in the, the large corporations, the largest, the, the, the land in different places to start being for the food producers. How do we scale up? How do we get buy-in politically, at least, from small you know, municipal government and work through municipal government to the, pro the province to the federal, how do we scale up to be heard? As a municipal councilor, and I was for one time, the only thing we started to listen to is Extinction Rebellion came to us and said, declare a climate emergency. We did. The next move were very costly, so we didn't take them. How do we begin to scale up? What's the readiness piece for small places, whether it's climate change or, or, or watching mountainsides being clear cut? Um, how do we gear up for that? How do we scale up? Any clues, anybody on that one? Do you want me to start? Sure. Yeah, and then uh, the others can follow. Just, just very briefly. Um, you know, one way, one very concrete thing that can be done is just to just to recall, um, recall that a, a American, uh, what was he, a newspaper man or journalist or politician or something, Horace Greeley, he used to always say, go west, young man, go west, young man, right? Uh, to, you know, basically, you know, f steal land from the Indians and conquer it and become rich. Um, there is going to be, if there isn't already, a go north, young man attitude that's going to begin emerging very rapidly as the Arctic opens up. It's already happening. Um, and it's not just Canada, but it's elsewhere. And so, you know, Atlantic Canada in a way is very well positioned now to begin thinking ahead and saying, it, this is going to happen no matter what <laughs> climate change or not, or it it maybe not necessarily climate change affected people, but there will be people looking northwards that didn't traditionally look northwards as a place to go to. So preparing, if you want to have a greater population there, which is the feeling I'm getting, at least to a certain degree, um, in, in a place where people often leave, as Rankin was saying, um, you know, position yourself wisely, um, be ahead of the curve and say, well, you know, I mean, Canada was always ahead of the curve on refugee policy globally. And, uh, you know, you very much, whether it was written down or not, it's another story, but, you know, very often uh, your refugee policy was based on, uh, which is very progressive and, and you know, world leading in many respects, um, was based on getting the best and the brightest from some of the countries where there were large refugee flows, you know, the, the most highly educated, the most entrepreneurial people. Um, so, you know, a similar approach can be applied not to, you know, to, discriminate against those who aren't the best and the brightest or anything, but, you know, think, think forward in five, 10, 20 year um, timeframes, look at what local environmental conditions are most likely to be um, and see what can be done to, uh, you know, essentially prepare the ground. So one concrete thing that could be done within government is just to create an official or an office um, that is 
dedicated to resolving climate displacement, both internally vis-a-vis -vis Atlantic Canada, and then any other role that it might play regarding other Canadians that may wish to move there um, or others from other countries that may wish to immigrate or migrate there. And I can go on and on, but I'll stop there and give the floor back to Rankin and David. Greg, I, I think that, it, uh, let me jump in here for a second. I, I think that uh, this is part of the work that we're undertaking around climate change and democracy. And you you started with a quote that I, I had made, which I don't think is original with me. I think Jim Hansen was the first person to say this, but we can't fix climate without first fixing democracy. And fixing democracy is kind of a 35,000 foot level. So let me say two things. One is that in trying to rethink how we do the public business, uh, we start off with uh, at least one hand tied behind our back because we've surrendered so much power to corporations. And in the States, at least, corporations are considered to be persons. Well, you and I, all of us on this call are, are persons. We we're born, we die, we have limited assets, we can only be in one place at one time and so forth until we had Zoom calls. Uh, but corporations can be everywhere, they're global. And I would ask Rankin, why, what happened to the proceeds from mining coal in Cape Breton? Where did that go? And who gave them permission to do that? Uh, the same could be a set of oil. We don't produce oil, we extract oil. And the extractive economy has left us all poorer, certainly as, as, as a public. And so the way we do the public business, if we're gonna do it democratically, we have to invent a better democracy than we have now. One that has foresight, one that has equality basically built into it, and one that asks bigger questions. So if the founders of uh, our, our three or four countries knew when they founded the country, what we now know about earth system science, how would they have written constitutions or created countries uh, for a world of uh, leads and lags, surprises, feedback loops, uh, stocks and flows? That's the reality we have to now calibrate to. That's at 35,000 feet. And so to that end, we've organized a, a project that includes uh, uh, Arizona State University and the Cleveland City Club and Denver University and a bunch of other organizations to begin to harness university assets to get at this issue of how we do the public business and reinvent democracy in the process. Not, not just tinker with the edges and not just uh, in the, the case of the United States, tinker with voting rights, which is very important, but begin to get at fundamentals that include giving rights to future generations, rights to other species, rights to landscapes, and then take that seriously. And then the, the second thing, coming back down to ground level, I think what uh, Scott said is, is incredibly smart. It's begin, what, what can we do here now? How can we help solve these problems? And Rankin, I, uh, I appreciate your work. 40 some years is a long time to give to building a place that honors people and their rights. That is a noble uh, life and a noble career. And uh, you went home and in that homecoming, uh, you improved the place of your birth. And we need lots of homecomers in this, uh, this coming century. But to begin to build that that groundwork, that groundswell for real democracy. So I think we have to begin to think at both levels. We have to think of that 35,000 foot level, uh, corporate rights, government business, the law, the whole court system, income distribution. Why do we have so many uh, really poor people and so few really wealth wealthy people that own what, half the wealth of the world or whatever it is? But those are questions that need to be asked and need to be an answer, answered. But then, the roots of democracy always grow out of uh, places uh, like uh, Cape Breton and Oberlin and small places where the spirit of democracy, that we care for each other, we care for the land, we care for those yet to be born. And that caring doesn't start at 35,000 feet. That starts in places, uh, as Rankin demonstrated in, in, uh, in his organization. We need homecomers, but we also need dreamers people who can see a future that is worth uh, fighting for, worth living in, that, that hope 
uh, that is so essential to all improvement that does the impossible. I'll stop there. Franken? Um, well, look, I, I must say, I really, I'm still, um, first of all, I'm kind of hooked on uh, 68, the water's gonna rise 68 meters, like I'm still back there. Powerful, powerful number. Um, and I and I am as I was when we when we had a chance to chat before. I mean that that connection for me between democracy and climate change is just um, that is really important to me to hear that. Um, in terms of um, one time, one time, a uh, long time ago, long, long time ago, and so this was in another life entirely. I, I was uh, I was working um, as a on the social side of a in a small correctional center, and I had this grand uh, mentor there, and we were he was with us part time, and we were trying to have an impact on the staff in terms of changing the attitude of the staff. And there were sixty staff, frontline staff. And, and one of the things, which was a lot of staff and a lot of, lot of issues in terms of troubles that we were having with them. And I remember he said to me, listen, we don't need 60. We need a critical mass and that's six. If we can, if we can get to six, we'll change it. We need to bring six on with us. And then the rest is just details. And I and I think on the one, so I, I mean, to go back in terms of, a, I'm like, I'm really, I'm really kind of imagining um, moving on the suggestion, Scott's suggestion that we really got a map, what's gonna happen in our, in our own backyard here in Atlantic Canada. Like what's, what's the next five, 10, 15 years look like in terms of the change that's coming. And I was thinking, well, that'd be an interesting thing to rally around. Um, and, and you don't need, you don't need, uh, we don't need the whole community to start with. We just need a critical mass to get involved in that, uh, to be part of that, to be engaged in that. Um, and I, it would be interesting to see what happens then. I mean, I, I have no faith, really, I'm sorry. And this might be my particular experience and Gregory and David and Scott, your experience may be different. Like I've got no faith uh, and, and, and there's a lot of good people work with government. So I don't mean to dismiss people, but I've got no faith in government leading anything. Government will follow, always they'll follow. But, but so I think, I think uh, so and, and this again, I've got a very limited experience, eh? but what I've always found is that when people, when, when people, when you get them engaged, and they understand what, what, they, what they need to deal with, or they become convinced they need to deal with it, there's a lot of energy there. And, and once, once you get that energy, um, who knows what's possible? Who knows what's possible? Um, I, one time, I'll say, I'll say this, one time Carl Jung, uh, the, the psychoanalyst said that um, the only hope, this is long before climate change, clearly, the only hope for mankind is that, there, that, there, that we, will, we will come upon an issue wherein it's going to take the, the whole, the collective of the, on the whole earth to deal with that issue. And then we will come together and understand um, that we are one another's neighbor. And and I mean, I, and I when when I hear like when I hear the numbers in terms of what the hell's happening, it's, it is it is it is quite overwhelming. And quite frankly, it's it makes my heart beat, not in a good way. But it does seem to me that embedded in this is is the possibility of a challenge 
that could take us to a better place as an earth. Or, or if, if that doesn't happen, we're not gonna make it anyway. So this is, this is like, what the hell else is there to do but to try to take advantage of it? Here's a, here's a couple questions from, from some of the participants. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and mesh two of the questions. One's from Madeline Cowicher. Um, and um, the other one is from uh, Leslie. And to put those two together, that, um, and this may be some of Scott's reaction to some of Scott's work. If, if we, the land in Canada becomes kind of a climate displacement haven, how do you square that with the rising sea level issue? And Canada is going to, at least Atlantic Canada, may shrink dramatically in terms of its land mass because of mm -hmm. climate change. And even if you do get climate change immigrants here, how do you retain them? We had some experience trying to do that. There was a report done several years ago, 2015 or so. The, the Ivany report became the now or never report that we needed to, to increase immigration. We did, but they didn't stay long. Scott, how do you deal with those issues? Well, um, you know, like I said, if I was hanging out in Atlantic Canada, I would have a lot more ideas, you know, if I hung out there for a couple of weeks, even let alone a couple of months. But from afar, what, you know, um, one of the first things any political jurisdiction has to do in, in this era of climate change is do the proper diagnosis of the situation, you know, and very few political jurisdictions have done proper comprehensive diagnostic work in terms of how climate, how is climate change going to affect our political jurisdiction in detail, you know, temperature wise, heat wise, drought wise, sea level rise wise, property loss wise, etc. So I don't know if that work has been comprehensively carried out in, in Atlantic Canada, it would be exceptional if it had been. So that's a first step. Um, where is this, where are the problems going to be the worst? What's it most likely going to look like under, you know, three, four, five different scenarios down the line? Um, and then, and then you can begin to start thinking about, well, if we're, if we're actually going to lose land and if we're actually going to lose part of our coastline, uh, where are those people going to go in the first instance? And then secondly, um, if you want to try to induce, um, immigration from the rest of Canada and or uh, the rest of the world, where could those people go? So one, you know, one of the ideas we've been touting in uh, all around the world, but we were actually making, surprisingly, making some traction with this on in the Myanmar, in Burma, before the horrible military coup of the 1st of February this year. Um, and that was the idea of setting up climate land banks. So this is just a, one of many concrete practical things you can do at the local level um, to begin to understand the needs of people in your jurisdiction, both current ones and future ones in terms of having access to land. So the issues that we worked on in Myanmar, for instance, we identified a whole range of um, piece, actual land parcels in that country that could have been used uh, you know, as much as possible adjacent to the most threatened coastal communities that could be used as a place to fall back onto if the people had to relocate. We don't ever advocate relocation in the first instance. We only advocate it in the last instance when there's no other option. But if there is no other option, it's much better to assist people to do it in the right way, as close as possible to where they're living now, than somewhere really far away. So, mm. you know, Atlantic Canada, Canada could easily establish a de facto, you know, land bank, climate land bank. So not a normal land bank, because that can be used and manipulated in a very, let's say, like pro-corporatist manner. Um, but where could people go to? What, where can we set aside land in Atlantic Canada for future settlements? Then you start planning and you look at, at work like David has done and Rankin has done and many others what kind of settlements would you want to have established in these new places, you know, and why not make them as ecologically, uh, you know, in tune as possible and turn, you know, create eco villages or eco minded places where the, where people could go and settle. And then obviously there has to be some sort of economic base that, that will uh, hold these people there. 
and once again, I mean, if, uh, you know, there's a lot of countries in the world which are doing decently uh, and sometimes exceptionally on, uh, on the economic front that don't have access to a lot of resources. So it's not necessarily one's national or local wealth is not always linked to having a huge amount of national, natural resources in the immediate vicinity. And particularly in the digital age, there's all sorts of possibilities probably that are um, possible in somewhere like uh, Atlantic Canada. And let me just finally end on well, two very really interesting points. One is the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, did one of the world's first ever global surveys, almost like a, glo like a kind of a preliminary global vote on whether the international community should do more on climate change. And that, that was just in the last six months. Um, and they got tens of thousands, maybe even more um, people to actually vote using their phones on, on should the UN do more on climate change, especially. And of course, the huge majority said yes. So, you know, that's the beginning of, of a process that we can perhaps envision, envision going much, much higher and much more broad. And then finally, just to make sure that you know that it's possible, we did this big project on land access and, and climate displacement. And we've, we discovered that globally, I'll, I'll leave out all this other statistics, but globally, if every single person was displaced that is expected to be displaced, we would still only require 0.14% of the earth's land surface to resettle all of the world's climate displaced people. So that we did that primarily to show that there is land available. It's not a question of there not being land. It's a question of political will and political wisdom. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I hope that's Scott, that, that is that is really interesting uh, numbers. That, that's an astounding number. Uh, let me build on your uh, uh, very well said remarks by saying this. If you could poll data and polls from the United States and all over the world, there's a huge majority right now of people across all spectrums, religions, races and ethnicities in favor of what we call sustainable development. It might vary in, in terms of description a little bit, but you want a solar powered world or fossil fuel powered world? Overwhelmingly people want sunlight to power their lives. Uh, do you want just incomes and, or uh, let the rich just run rampant? Uh, inevitably you find strong majorities for justice and so forth. So it seems to me that the, the revolution in some ways, the battle for hearts and minds has already been won. It's a little bit like being back in I don't know, the year, I don't know, 1770 or some such, and say to your neighbor, let's go out and watch the Enlightenment happen. Well, yeah. where was the Enlightenment happening? It was happening everywhere. Uh, in artists and writers all over the Western Europe and uh, throughout the English-speaking world. And the Enlightenment was happening. And in some places, it happened in different languages and different cultures. But it was underway. And I think there is, in our time, there's something like an ecological enlightenment underway globally now. And the media mean you can't keep secrets uh, in the United States or Canada or Australia, they're gonna go global. And so better ways to farm, better ways to build, better ways to transport. Uh, and even uh, love in this sense is kind of exportable. The Dato Sea had a humongous uh, response. Uh, but so to all the religious leaders of the world. I, I think that we've reached a point where there is a critical mass and there are uh, Rankin McSween's at the local level doing incredibly brilliant things, uh, laboring out of the spotlight uh, maybe, but there is this period of enormous creativity. The cork in the bottle is these old institutions of governance that uh, privileged money, uh, privilege the wrong people, the laws need to be up, upgraded, but even there you find that most people now agree that governments that represent we in some form or fashion need to be changed. So we need a recalibration of governance that prevents uh, uh, David, how do, uh, this, this things to happen at the local level. But one other thing, for your next, uh, uh, when you talk, the, the, the next session you do on the economy, Herman Daly, who's the founder of, of Cassie, once put it this way, we need macro controls at this upper level, but micro variability at the local level. That's the trick. 
Yeah. To, to mesh a, a, a couple questions here on, on this, the, the, the local leadership issue. I mean, how do we, it seems to me what kills us often, I think, is party politics. We, we can't, the strategies for climate change have to be long-term. Local mm -hmm. municipalities are dealing with that, even with climate change action plans. Every municipality in 2012 and 2013 had to design a municipal climate change action plan, if for no other reason, to keep a, a, a steady stream of gas tax money coming into the municipalities. But, but local politics are very fickle. Provincial politics are very fickle. Every four years or so, we have a change. So there's no continuity. How do we begin, how do we solve that, that issue? And how do we try and, and get political leadership that turns the, the, the table and starts to educate citizens and put in place some sort of ecological literacy um, from that level? I mean, how, how do you turn that corner, David? Well, I, I think that there, there are several things. One is you take money, in the case of the United States, you take money out of politics. So you, you remove money from campaigns and all that finance. We pay for it anyway. Let's pay for it above board, not below the board. And so take money out of politics. That's one thing. Secondly, I think that there, there's civic education, certainly in the states, and I suspect most everywhere has lagged. And so the pronouns, it, as civic education has lagged, economic education or indoctrination has uh, run apace. And what it's done is to change our pronouns. And so our pronouns for democracy are we, ours, and us. But for markets and for economists, it's I, me, and my. And we've got to change that. We've got to begin to give politics a priority over the economy. And the instructions are coming from we the people to the economy, not the other way around. And the third thing I, I would say, I would say this, uh, take money out of politics. Let's, let's begin to get the economy back in, in uh, line. But um, the third thing is this, if I go in the States to get a driver's license, I have to take, I have to read a little manual and I have to take a test and I have to know all this stuff about the rules of the road, lest I drive a car into the ditch or kill somebody. But I can be elected to the Senate of the United States or to a state legislative body without understanding anything about how the earth works as a physical system and why that is important for what I would do as a legislator or as a banker or whatever. We ought to have a test. And I, my tongue is not entirely in my cheek. We can no longer afford ecologically ignorant people in places where they control lots of other people's lives. If I sound like Bernie Sanders there, I, I, I mean it. I think that there, there should be a test for public leadership. And we assume we leave it up to the voter, but then uh, if you have enough money, you can make anybody look good. You can even put con men uh, in the presidency of the United States. Uh, I'll stop there I, before I say something dangerous. Can I, can I just ask a question, Greg? Uh, so I, I'm, and this is a question to the, both Scott and David. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do, at least I think there's been some references to this kind of new, a new kind of governance that's really called for that We've got these old models, and they're essentially old models that were part of the industrial economy. I mean, McLuhan said that um, government always readapts itself to the nature of the economy. <clears throat> and this may be this may be quite. This is I, I'm asking the question because I'm concerned that I'm being quite naive about something. Like for me, the basis of democracy is, is de Tocqueville's understanding that it's really the civil society. Okay? I mean, when all of his misgivings about the American Revolution uh, were, were not all put to rest, but most of them were put to rest when he went to the States and he discovered what the Americans had invented in terms of civil society and thought, ha ha, it's gonna work. So, 
again, I mean, and, and maybe, I mean, maybe, uh, maybe this is naive, but I, I, I mean, I do, my impulse is always to say the problem is we need, or the challenge is, as the challenge has always been, how do we engage people in a particular, in a particular issue, okay? And, I, and I, I really accept, I mean, you make a great point, David, in terms of what's happened and that we are, in terms of the number of people that are now engaged are a bit of a, at a tipping point. Okay, so how do we take it over, over to the top? How do we take it over to the top? And, and again, I'm sorry to repeat myself, but I really have no faith in terms of public institutions leading that. Now, maybe that's unfair. And I'm just a boy from the country who had some bad experiences with the public sector. But I, in terms of, in terms of, for me, I, I tend to move away when Greg, when you talk about municipal government or state governments or national governments, I tend to sort of cringe and want to go somewhere else because I, I, I just haven't witnessed success in terms of going that route. But my experience is small. So I'd be really interested in getting some reactions to that. Let me let me offer two things very quickly, and then uh, ask Scott to fill in uh, his part. I think that we've asked government to do more than governments can do, and so a good bit of the frustration is we dump all of these things on right. government to do all of this stuff, and so it's expanded enormously. And then we've given it the power to fight wars. So in the United States, our trillion dollar a year, you know, quote, defense budget uh, adds a whole nother burden. There are so many experiments, however, that if you put things back down at the local level, the old subsidiary principle. Yes. So you yes. say to local people, you figure out how to power your community by renewable energy and turn people loose to do that. They'll do that. Yes. Uh, if you want local food, let's take some of the subsidies away from big uh, agribusiness and give it back to local communities to take part of the burden of feeding themselves back on themselves. And so begin to reduce the, the burdens on government. And I think that that, in fact, is beginning to happen. And so there are there are lots of experiments. There is a political scientist at Yale, Helen Helene Landemir. Uh, who talks about work in France and in Iceland and other places, but there's a, there's a very vibrant literature now of stories coming from local communities where they were able to solve local problems. Uh, so it means, uh, Gregory asked, how do we scale up? In a way, I don't know that you scale up, but you scale out. So you replicate these experiments and they're being replicated all over the world. It's hard to go to any place, at least in the United States and Europe, without finding really exciting things happening at the local level. So the role of government up here is to allow those things to happen at the local level, remove some regulations, provide funding, remove the barriers, uh, but do the things that government needs to do up here for taxation and justice and those, those things that only can happen at the very top. But I, I share your frustration. I think it's solvable. I think that democracy, again, uh, Rankin, in your experience, uh, you know this better than anybody in the panel. When problems came to you, you found solutions and you could find enough people that they disagree and they're cantankerous, but uh, they'll work it out. So I, I think it, it's a solvable problem, but I think you're exactly right to, <laughs> to raise it. it. It's got to be dealt with. One of the questions that, that, that's, that's come up a couple of times here with, from some of the audience is, is this um, local governance, local food, local readiness piece, is in a sense, is, is it being a bit naive because the powers that be, the large corporations and the large international governments and the ability to make war on a, on a, on a global scale, those are still there. Um, and, uh, and, it's, we can do, the choice is either do we, do we try and 
draw down CO2 so there, the climate change thing is minimized? Or we, is it just adaption? Do we just adapt to all those changes that are coming at us? But is it just naive to think that we can, like Margaret Wheatley talks about, that we become this island of sanity in, in Atlantic Canada, but yet all these stressors, global stressors are still there. Well, there's at 35,000 feet at the abstract level, those problems were more often than not caused by the fact that we didn't pay the prices that we were, the damage that we were incurring. The prices didn't tell the truth. And so you, you could say that, for example, a carbon tax is beginning to say, you, you got, if you want to burn fossil fuels, okay, but then you're going to have to pay the full cost of that. And the same is true with the food system. And so we were never as rich as we thought we were or as we were told we were. Uh, COVID, for example, is an interesting case because here you have this global economy that's invading uh, forests in China and Africa and elsewhere. And we're finding all these diseases that then cross boundaries in, into humans. But nobody, none of the companies that were engaging in this moving these heavy things long distances in this global world were paying an insurance policy for what happens when you move small things like viruses long distances. And like uh, you, you have to take insurance out on your house, they weren't taking insurance out on the fact that sooner or later they would cause a pandemic. That was simply built into their market. They didn't talk about it, uh, but we knew it was gonna happen. Laurie Garrett wrote the book, The Coming Pandemic in 1995, I think it was. And the same is true on climate change. There should have been a tax imposed on all the oil and extractive industries. Uh, but we scrapped public transportation in this country uh, in favor of gas guzzling cars. That was done for reasons that were really uh, remarkably stupid. But there, there's, there, there's an economic injustice is what I'm, I'm trying to say. In terms of the more global scale, it, it, two things in, in this period of withdrawal that I went through and in, in doing as much research as I can, two things kept coming to me. If we don't find a way uh, to solve the population problem and the, the high level of consumption, nothing may work. And I don't know, it, it, it's, I mean, we have, how, how do, what's the role of individuals? What's the role of government in terms of this consumption? Even if we decide we're gonna stop burning fossil fuels and we're gonna go with electric cars. At some point, if we don't gear back so there's not, everyone has two or three electric cars, the mining of lithium, we might have been better off burning fossil fuels. And it's that consumption piece. Is there a role for local government, federal government on, on this whole idea of consumer spending, consumption, advertising, limits to advertising? Is it, um, how do we deal with that piece? Can I just add, um, in response to that, you know, you use the perfect word, limit, <laughs> you know? The last 40 years, particularly, you know, the real neoliberal economic period uh, that we have been living through um, since Thatcher and Reagan and others started it um, is predicated on, uh, on there being no limits to consumption or to the amassing of wealth. And the entire economic system and the political systems now are beholden to those who hold those assets. So one of, the, one of the things in my humble opinion that we need to do, and, and there's no ideology in the world, there's no political uh, party way of thinking that says we should have 3000 billionaires on planet earth, each holding a tremendously disproportionate amount of political and economic power. Where does it say that we should have that? I haven't seen it anywhere. We shouldn't have billionaires on planet earth for starters. I mean, eight, as uh, David was referring to, you know, I mean, eight of the richest billionaires have more assets than 50% of the human race. And, and the problem starts there. And we need, to, we need to get into our collective minds that nobody should be allowed to amass that much economic power because it totally undermines uh, democracy and the basic principles of equality that 
need to exist in order for democracy to continue on a planet where less than 10% of people today live in a truly you know, effectively, efficiently run democratic country. It's a small minority, unfortunately, and the number of authoritarians and, and ultranationalists and white supremacists, et cetera, are just increasing in number, right? But we're at this historic juncture now, I think, between, I forget the precise quote, but you know, the old world is ending, the new world is being born, and in the middle of it is this you know, period of chaos. But let me, let me just give one more concrete example of um, local initiative that can be done anywhere, um, you know, notwithstanding all the drawbacks of government and stuff. But um, I learned a lot about this in Brazil, you know, it's in Porto Alegre from the, the PT, the Workers' Party people, Lula's party, who started this thing called participatory budgeting, whereby the population as a whole was asked. I think, that, I think it was 10% of the local budget was set aside for sort of community decision-making. What do you want us to spend uh, the money on? So it was taken out of the representative democracy circle as in elected officials, and it was given back to the community themselves. And they chose some incredible things to spend the money on, you know? So I think, you know, processes like that, which are concrete and real, uh, can really, you know, provide both hope to people, but also induce them to become involved um, locally. And then, you know, you build up uh, democracy that way. And, but at the end, remember Socrates, right where David's sitting in the middle of Athens famously said, I am neither a citizen of Athens nor a citizen of Greece. I am a citizen of the world, you know? Mm. And that's what, in my humble opinion, we need to go back to. Every single one of us on, on planet earth calls it mother earth, right? There's no country in the world that doesn't use that term, right? Mm. So if, earth is our mother, then all of us are related to that very place. And we need to get back to that, I believe, because how can we go on in a world where all the countries where we were born, presumptively, you know, just by virtue of being born there, we're 70 times richer than somebody born on the same day in sub-Saharan Africa. It doesn't work. Well, I have to say my, 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 my chat box and, <laughs> and question is lit up here like a, like a, Roman, like a Roman candle. I mean, I, I mean the, the responses and the interest here are just staggering me. And so I don't know how to weed these out because we're kind of running out of time. But one that just kind of fascinated me on, on, on consumer spending is, is uh, Margot asked, is it possible to tax uh, excessive advertising. Has anyone, has that ever risen anybody? I mean, can you tax advertisers? Well, you excessive tax, advertising. You, you can tax anything. I, I would see no reason why you, you, you shouldn't tax. But what the, the better way to do, do this, I think, would be to prevent, uh, as some Scandinavian countries have done, advertising to children. So instead of uh, beginning to develop little many consumers at uh, young ages, uh, you, you're simply forbidden from uh, advertising to them. But I, I think that Scott's making a, a really very good point that you just can't have the levels of inequality that we have. And uh, the other point I, I fully agree with is that there's so many experiments, you mentioned Port Allegra, but there, there are also lots of other experiments around the world where decisions have come back down to local levels and people make pretty smart decisions collectively. This is uh, Helene Landemir's uh, point in her book, Open Democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've got, we're, ju we're just about out of time here. We can, can't respond to, uh, to all of these questions. And it's interesting, a lot of these questions, I always felt that sometimes not only do we have to change the narrative to a new narrative, but we have to find out ways to slow down the old narrative. And, and one of the things to do that in a couple of questions have started to, to raise out on the whole idea of, of how do we fight corporations. I think that's, that we're going to deal with that in, in the, the session in uh, July um, on, on litigation. Uh, so, so that's a piece that's going to come up in time and time again. All of these things, the governance piece, the economy piece, the rights for nature piece, and the new architecture physically built things are all interrelated. So I'm gonna to have to end it now. This has been an absolute marvelous discussion and I can't tell you how much I thank the panelists. 
but these raft of people who have asked questions, there, there's a book here <laughs> unfolding on the side of my screen. And, uh, um, and at the, the, the last point that I would just end with a comment is, how do we begin to get politicians to think like us? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but, but I'll, I'll hold that for another day. But I, I want to, David and, and, and Scott and Rankin, I thank you so much for uh, your 150 to 200 years of experience <laughs> doing this. You, you, you are all wear it well. And I thank you so much. And I thank all the people that have joined this discussion. And these dialogues are just the first of many discussions that the Center for Local Prosperity would like to have on the local grassroots level. And I just want to remind people that if they all wanted to sign up to this, it's always the policy of the Center for Local Prosperity that if cost of any of these programs, we have always made it available to anyone. Uh, don't let cost prohibit uh, your uh, engagement in these. So with that, Scott, uh, be, be good down there in the, in the south of us. Rankin, thank you so much. Welcome to retired life. And David, I know uh, this isn't your only gig this week. <laughs> <laughs> so right. I thank you all. I thank you all very much. Very thank you. Thanks for putting us all together. Pleasure. Thanks, to you. Thanks to the thank other you. two guys. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you all and good night. Good night. Very well. Bye, everybody. <laughs>